Should you buy this book? That's the question that I want to answer today. And what is this book? Well, this is Clean Architecture. It's by Uncle Bob, probably one of the most famous programmers in the world. He wrote a whole bunch of other books like Clean Code and Clean Coder, and he kind of knows what he's talking about. Now, this book is kind of popular on the internet. It's all over the place. It's on a lot of programmer reading lists. And currently it's ranked number 38 on Amazon's programming bestsellers list. I don't know if that's good, but that's what number it is. Now I'm going to help you decide whether or not you should buy this book. And in order to do that, I'm going to divide this into three different sections. First, I'm going to talk about what this book is about, just a little bit about Robert Martin and generally what the themes are in this book. Then I'm going to talk to you about the key takeaways that I took from this book personally. And then finally, I'm going to give you my summary and whether or not I can recommend it or not for you to read. So first of all, who is this book even for? Well, it's for software developers. And if you're a beginner software developer, especially even if you're a more mid career or veteran software developer, I think this book is beneficial to all different skill levels. Talking about this personally, I kind of learned a lot of the concepts of software development and software architecture just by kind of going into the trenches and experiencing it and seeing what it looked like in real life. And I can tell you that when I read this book after the fact, a lot of the concepts and the principles that it teaches you are very applicable to real life. A lot of these things that it teaches you are in fact how it works. Um, so looking at this in retrospect, I wish I knew about this stuff earlier. I wish I liked to read more as I, as I like to read now, but take that as you will. And the essence of the book is that often when we're working with a code base, you, you know, if it's good or bad, right? Like it's either good and you know that because it's easy to add features. It's easy to change things. Documentation is always up to snuff. Uh, everything is just gravy. And when it's a bad code base, you know, the complete opposite happens. You often just end up banging your head against the wall, trying to sort out trivial problems or solve small things that shouldn't take a long time. Um, and so the idea with this book is teaching you the kind of pillars or the principles that you need to apply to your daily life so that you can get your code into the good state, into the state that we all want our code to be, where it's easy to maintain, easy to develop new features for, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, this book is about keeping you on the path if you're on the path and kind of course correcting you or teaching you the principles to course correct yourself if you're working with a problematic code base. Uh, that being said, it's also great if you're just starting out because this will teach you a lot of the principles that you need to know about in terms of how to set up your project and kind of define the core entities that in the end are gonna end up being the thing that drive your architecture. So that's what this book is about. Now I wanna talk about the kind of important bits from this book and the key takeaways that I took from it personally. And it starts out by talking about a lot of the basic concepts that you learn in any standard computer science program. Uh, so things like object-oriented programming, things like functional programming, procedural programming, structural programming, all these different types of programming. And it turns out there's some principles that you can apply from the different programming types to your architecture. So that's why he spent some time talking about it. Now, along that same line, the book talks about these solid principles and there's five solid principles. And these are the kind of Bible for software developers in terms of kind of principles that you apply to your daily life when you're building architecture and they kind of guide some of the key decisions that you need to make. Uh, so if you don't know what solid is, I can just kind of recap them for you. So the S in solid stands for the single responsibility principle. And this is the idea that a class should be responsible for one thing, one domain. The O in solid is for the open close principle, which is that a class should be open for extension, but closed for modification. The L is the Liskov substitution principle, which basically means you should use polymorphism whenever it's possible. If you don't know what polymorphism is, uh, I'd highly suggest you watch a video and just look up a definition. Uh, it's a very useful concept in a lot of these conversations. The I is for the interface segregation principle, which is that it's usually better to have multiple interfaces for different use cases as opposed to one overloaded use case. And then the D is for the dependency inversion principle. And this means that you should only depend on abstractions whenever possible. And your higher order components should never depend on your lower order components. So after he talks about that, he talks about a lot of how these principles apply to some software architecture concepts. Um, so he brings in a lot of the talk about service oriented architecture. And if you don't know what service oriented architecture is, uh, let me just give you the brief about it. Uh, so service oriented architecture is the idea that you separate your application out into different domains, different components. Uh, so say for instance, if we're working with a credit card application that's responsible for processing customer transactions, we may say, okay, maybe it makes sense to have a service called the transaction service. 
And this service is responsible for being the ledger. This is gonna handle kind of the commits to the database and gonna be your single source of truth whenever transactions are accepted and committed in your system. Then in the middle, maybe you have an authorization service and this service can be responsible for simply authorizing whether or not a transaction is possible. And then over on the side here, you can have a different service that's responsible for fielding customer requests to authorize those requests and finally commit those to the database whenever they are authorized. So that's kind of how you can separate out a fairly basic example into service oriented architecture. Uh, so he talks a lot about the benefits of this, you know, decoupling independent deployments. Uh, you can move a lot faster in service oriented architecture. Now he also does mention that a lot of companies don't have the luxury or the resources to build out service oriented architecture. So he suggests how to kind of organize and lay out your source code dependencies and your packet structures in a way that lets you extend those into a service oriented architecture friendly format if you decide to go down that path. And I thought that was a very interesting idea idea and one of the side effects of going through this exercise of cutting up your service into different roles and kind of assigning them different responsibilities is that you end up building modules and that's another common theme of this book it's the the promotion of this idea of modules or components that are responsible for specific things now the next major section that he talks about is regarding details and he makes this argument that uh, a lot of the things that we worry about at the beginning of a project don't actually matter that much until you're further along in the process. So the idea is to delay these types of decisions to the last possible moment to give you the most flexibility. And I'll give you a perfect example on this. Uh, in the book, he's talking about building this application with his son, and he's talking about how they didn't even have a database for this application up until like a couple months before they were gonna launch this thing. And the reason they didn't need one is because they built an interface that sits in front of the database. So now all the calling code doesn't have to know about the, the implementation of the database or even whether or not you know it's a NoSQL database or a MySQL database or a graph database or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, that decision can be delayed up until a very later point. Now for a lot of applications, that's a very wise thing to do because us as developers, we get obsessed with certain types of technologies and we're like, hmm, which one should we use here? Which one's a better idea? And really that kind of stuff doesn't really matter until a later point in time. Uh, he even mentions that in this kind of example he was talking about, they didn't have a database. They were writing to flat files for a very long period, which I thought was just fascinating. And another key part of this discussion is like drawing boundaries. That's what service oriented architecture kind of thinking allows you to do. It allows you to draw boundaries between systems so that they're elegant, they have interface and the ways in which these two different systems or n number of systems interact with each other is formalized through an interface. Uh, so that's kind of a, a big kind of takeaway that he kind of repeats throughout the book. Uh, there's also this talk on entities and policy and your entities are kind of the core domain object, the core business object that your kind of space is working with. And a lot of the business rules are kind of encoded into your domain objects. Then he talks about different layers. The one above that is called the policy layer and the policy is the thing that Basically in an application, it's usually like the manager class where a lot of the logic actually takes place, like what to do, what and when. And so he talks a lot about the different layers of an application and how you can build it out. But I guess the question at the end of the day is, should you even buy this book? And my recommendation is yes, and here's why. First of all, it's an easy read. It's not too deep, it's not too thorough. It's something you can read before bed and still get it without having your brain to be in like hyper overdrive mode. Second of all, it teaches you a lot about the principles that I wish I knew before I entered the software industry. A lot of this stuff is basic, but seeing how he applies it to real life examples is invaluable. And like I said at the beginning of this video, a lot of the concepts that you learn in this book, I actually apply in real life pretty regularly. So that just goes to show you how useful it is from a professional perspective, like this stuff makes sense and it's useful. Overall, I would say just buy this book. It's good to have to learn some of the basic concepts. And even if you already know some of these concepts, it's good to get a refresher from time to time. And this book puts it out in a very convenient, easy to digest way. And if you're a beginner, this is gonna teach you a lot of the basic concepts that people like me wish they knew about before you know they got into the industry. So there it is. I'll put a link to this book down below on Amazon if you wanna pick it up. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps me with the channel. Thanks so much and I'll see you next time.